Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much um, for joining. My name is Sarah Miller, and I am a professor of education at Queen's University in Belfast. Um, but I and I'm looking out on some beautiful sunshine at the moment, so I hope uh, you are um, as well. This is very rare for Northern Ireland, can I say? So that's why I've mentioned it. Um, I'm also director of Campbell UK and Ireland, um, and I am also editor and co-chair of the Education Coordinating Group uh, within Campbell um, as well. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here uh, today um, in my capacity as director of Campbell UK and Ireland, and we're hoping to kind of showcase some of the work uh, that we have been doing. And I'm joined by Dr Jennifer Hanratty. Um, who has been a long time member of uh, Cambria UK in Ireland and a colleague of mine. And I don't know, Jen, do you want to introduce yourself and do a much better job of it? <laughs> yeah, hi folks, um, welcome to the webinar today. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Dr Jennifer Hanati. Um, I've been um, working on evidence synthesis for the past um, decade or so, um, working on Campbell reviews and Cochrane reviews and other evidence synthesis um, products, um, and have a range of experiences um, with stakeholder engagement in reviews. So um, really hopeful that people will have lots of questions um, today. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jen. Um, so I just wanted to start off with just a brief introduction to um, Campbell UK and Ireland. Um, and to say kind of what we do. And so we're one of the National Research Centres um, for Campbell. And we've been in existence for the last sort of um, four or five years. And our remit really is to advocate for the use of Campbell systematic reviews in uh, policy and in practice. Also to provide training um, for people who are doing reviews, hopefully those who are doing Campbell reviews, but not exclusively. And also we do some reviews ourselves. So most recently, um, as a centre, we have done three um, systematic reviews in homelessness, uh, funded by the Centre for Homelessness Impact. And when we were setting up our uh, training for this year, we had a series of speakers over the last 12 months. And if you want to attend any of our training, you're more than welcome to. But one of our first speakers was Neil Hadaway, and he spoke to us about stakeholder um, engagement in all aspects really of the review process and it really got us to thinking in terms of sometimes it can be a little bit tokenistic how we involve stakeholders sometimes it's a little bit of an afterthought and sometimes we're not as planful as we might otherwise be around involving our stakeholders and actually sometimes even identifying who our stakeholders are um, is not particularly straightforward if we think about all of the different audiences for our review and who might be using our review. So it really got us thinking about how we might do this better. And so um, if you want to look up Neil Hadaway's um, materials and, and what he does, uh, we can make that available to you or you can look them up online. But that's what really kind of started um, the talk that you're going to hear this morning is by um, Karen McConnell and she'll be introducing herself. But um, Really, in this review uh, that Karen's working on with Kira Keenan was um, was they were very much inspired by what Neil had been telling them, and so their experience of involving stakeholders in their review that's what they are going to to talk about today. So Karen unfortunately can't join us in person, so um, but she has pre-recorded her video, which I'm going to. Uh, hopefully play for you now and what I thought we might do if that's okay with everybody is then listen to Karen's um, talk here what she has to say about how they involve stakeholders in their review and then come back together and um, if you have any questions uh, we can hopefully have a discussion um, based on your questions and also share some of our other experiences of stakeholder uh, engagement um, in our reviews as well because we're definitely learning as we go along too and we'd love to learn from your experiences as, as well and um, so I hope that will be and uh, we'll be able to do that so if you'll just bear with me while I share my screen with you Okay, so I will uh, pop back up um, in uh, about half an hour's time um, and I'll see you then. But if you have any questions, don't be afraid to put them in the chat um, and we'll pick them up um, either in person or in the chat at the end. All right. Welcome to the November webinar um, from Campbell UK and Ireland. Before I begin, I'd just like to thank Campbell UK and Ireland for the opportunity to share my experiences of stakeholder engagement in evidence synthesis at this webinar. 
And just to begin with a bit of an introduction about me then, my name is Karen McConnell and I'm a paediatric or children's physiotherapist and also a lecturer in physiotherapy at Ulster University. I have a special interest in research relating to children, um, children with neurodisabilities, and in particular, children with cerebral palsy or CP. And prior to my current position at Ulster University, I worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Northern Ireland Cerebral Palsy Register, which is a confidential record of, of all people with cerebral palsy in Northern Ireland, um, funded by the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland and held at Queen's University Belfast. I'm also interested in involving patients and public and stakeholders in the research process. And as part of my previous role, I, I was involved in testing or piloting the National Institute for Health Research Standards for Public Involvement in Research. And as part of this, I, I helped to establish a new public involvement group for the Northern Ireland Cerebral Palsy Register. And finally, I am, I am an ESI or an Evidence Synthesis Ireland Fellow, and I'm working on a systematic review and meta-analysis of video-based interventions in children with autism spectrum disorders, or ASD, which I will share a little bit more about shortly. So today I am going to be talking about firstly, a little bit about my Evidence Synthesis Ireland or ESI Fellowship. I'll then share about the systematic review and meta-analysis that I'm working on as part of um, my ESI fellowship. And as I've mentioned, this is with Campbell UK and Ireland, and it's a review of video-based interventions in children with ASD. I'll then introduce the area of stakeholder engagement or public involvement in evidence synthesis. And I would like to share what we as a review team did um, by way of a stakeholder engagement project. So I'll share with you what we aim to do, how we did it, and then the outcome of, of the stakeholder engagement project. I'll then share with you um, some of our experiences of doing this stakeholder engagement project, uh, including the challenges of engaging with stakeholders in this review, as well as some potential solutions um, to these challenges. To begin, I would like to just share a little bit about my Evidence Synthesis Ireland Fellowship or my ESI Fellowship, because quite simply, I wouldn't be here doing this webinar if it wasn't for the opportunity to complete this fellowship. So for those of you who don't know, Evidence Synthesis Ireland runs a fellowship scheme that gives fellows the opportunity to learn more about evidence synthesis and to develop key skills, for example, on how to plan, design, conduct and report an evidence synthesis. The scheme involves placing fellows virtually with experienced evidence synthesis centres and review teams. Uh, and fellows are, are very fortunate to receive great structured theoretical training from ESI and also from the review centres that they're placed with. And fellows also receive one-to-one -one mentorship from a designated person from within their review team. So in March of this year, I was fortunate enough to be awarded an ESI fellowship. And as I've mentioned, I was placed with Campbell UK and Ireland. Uh, and, and I have a fabulous mentor in Dr. Kira Keenan from Queen's University Belfast. Moving on then to tell you a little bit more about the systematic review and meta-analysis that, that I've mentioned that I'm working on for my ESI fellowship. So it's a review of video-based interventions in children with autism spectrum disorders or ASD. And I'm very fortunate to be working uh, in the review team with Dr. Kira Keenan, Dr. Catherine Storey and Professor Alan Thurston, who are all from Queen's University Belfast. And just to give you a bit of background information on the review and what we're aiming to achieve by carrying out this review. So for this review, we'd like to find out if video based interventions improve social behaviours in children with ASD. Which social behaviours benefit most from video based interventions? If the behaviours 
learnt during video-based interventions can be transferred to other situations and if they are maintained after the intervention ends. And finally, we'd also like to find out if certain characteristics such as age and gender have an influence on the effectiveness of video-based interventions in children with ASD. So moving on then to a little bit about stakeholder engagement, um, focused on evidence synthesis. At the beginning of my ESI fellowship, so earlier this year, Campbell UK and Ireland hosted a fabulous workshop on stakeholder engagement in evidence synthesis. And this workshop was facilitated by Dr. Neil Haraway, who's a senior research fellow at Stockholm Environment Institute with a huge, vast amount of expertise in the area of stakeholder engagement and evidence synthesis. So it was a fabulous opportunity to, to actually attend this workshop with someone who has such expertise in the area. Prior to the workshop, I was most familiar with the term patient and public involvement, and I'm sure maybe some of you are familiar with this term, and sometimes referred to as PPI or simply public involvement, as opposed to actually the term stakeholder engagement. But very early on in the workshop with Neil Hathaway, I discovered that patient and public involvement or PPI actually falls under the larger umbrella of stakeholder engagement. So for me, it was more about a change in language as opposed to a, a change in practice in relation to involving and uh, engaging with stakeholders and patients and public. So what is a stakeholder then? How do we define a stakeholder? Well, Freeman defines a stakeholder as any group or individual who is affected by or can affect the achievement of an organization's objectives. Engaging with stakeholders during evidence synthesis actually results in less chance of research bias. And stakeholders, so key um, individuals and groups, provide and bring with them a lot of knowledge and expertise in a particular area and a lot of experiences that the research or the review team simply don't have. And, and all of this knowledge and experience can really help to shape the context of the review and it can help to integrate uh, review findings and also integrate these findings into decision making. So due to the benefits of stakeholder engagement and um, within evidence synthesis, it makes sense then to engage with relevant groups and individuals as early as possible and during all stages of the review process. So whenever I joined uh, the review team looking at video-based interventions in children with ASD, the protocol was already in the process of being published. However, after attending Neil Hathaway's workshop on stakeholder engagement, um, and also after interviewing Sally Crow, who is a specialist in stakeholder engagement in research, I, I was certain that we, as a review team, could still engage with stakeholders in a meaningful way in order to help increase the relevance of the review that we're working on. Therefore, as a review team, we decided to engage with stakeholders, even though the review was already underway. Um, and, and to do this, we, we carried out a small stakeholder engagement project. So I'd like to just tell you a little bit more about this stakeholder engagement project that we did. Um, so what we aim to achieve, how we did it, and then some of the results of the outcome of the project, including our own experiences. Firstly, to set the scene, the stakeholder engagement project that, that we carried out aimed to inform data extraction, data analysis, write-up and dissemination of the systematic review of video-based interventions uh, for children with ASD. So specifically, we aim to identify relevant items and relevant information for data extraction from the papers included in the review. We also aim to inform any additional analyses, suggest potential outcomes of interest for future reviews, and advise on the most appropriate communication and dissemination methods for the review findings. And we wanted to find all of this information out from the perspectives of our key stakeholders, who we identified as being people with ASD, their families, their carers, health, 
education and voluntary sector organisations that work with people with ASD. So in terms of methods for this project then, first of all, um, we, we did seek ethical approval uh, for the project. We, we asked for guidance from the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work at Queen's University Belfast, and they recommended that we should indeed apply for ethical approval for this stakeholder engagement project. So that's what we did, and the approval was granted in July of this year. Our participants or stakeholders were people with ASD aged between um, or aged from 16 and up, parents or carers of people with ASD, as well as health, education and voluntary sector staff who work with people with ASD. And all of these stakeholders were invited to complete a cross-sectional online questionnaire survey about our systematic review uh, of video-based interventions in children with the condition. Recruitment um, to this project then, so stakeholders were recruited using a study information video and this information video was advertised on social media, um, namely Facebook and Twitter. And these were the accounts of the review authors and um, also several accounts related to, to Campbell, Queen's University Belfast and Ulster University. And I am going to play the recruitment video in a few moments um, just to give you a better idea of the project. Uh, and this video really detailed the aims of the study, what the study would involve, its voluntary nature, um, confidentiality issues, as well as contact details for the research team. For data collection then, so I've already mentioned that it was an online questionnaire survey. So the questionnaire was hosted on Microsoft Forms and the questionnaire included a covering note, a link to the information video that I will show in a moment, consent form for taking part in the project, uh, the questionnaire itself, and also contact details for the review or the research team. The questionnaire itself then, so the particular questions that we were looking at answers to. So we included um, questions about the participants' demographics, key data or information that should be extracted from the included papers, any additional analyses that would potentially benefit the review, how best to disseminate the review findings, uh, if there are any accessibility issues that we as a review team should consider whenever it comes to actually disseminating the findings of the review, and other potentially useful outcomes for future reviews. And then the final question in the survey asked if the participant agreed to further contact or if they were interested in further contact about joining the reviews advisory group. And then the planned meetings for the advisory group um, so included three meetings. So um, meeting one to discuss data extraction and any additional analyses that would be useful for the review. A second meeting to discuss preliminary results of the review um, and also to facilitate drafting of the manuscript. And then a third meeting to finalise the manuscript, identify um, dissemination methods and potential outcomes for future reviews. And I suppose just to highlight that the, the survey is completed and we're still in the process of establishing that advisory group. Advisory group. So I won't actually be talking any more about the advisory group in today's presentation. And Hopefully that will, will come a little bit uh, further down the line for us. So I'd just like to play the short animated video that we used for recruitment to this stakeholder engagement project. And it was it's just an animated video that was created um, using the free version of Powtoon. Researchers from Queen's University Belfast are asking for help with a systematic review on video-based interventions in children with Autism Spectrum Disorders, or ASD. We are asking people with ASD, their families, carers, healthcare and education professionals to complete a short survey as they bring personal knowledge and experiences which will help to improve the quality and relevance of the review and promote better sharing of the review findings. First, let's tell you a bit more about systematic reviews. Practice should be informed by the best available evidence, and it's important that we don't rely on the results of a single study. A 
systematic review attempts to collect all available evidence and research on a particular topic in order to answer a specific research question and get a fuller picture of the evidence. For this review, we would like to find out if video-based interventions improve social behaviours in children with ASD. Which social behaviours benefit most from video-based interventions? If behaviours learned can be transferred to other situations and maintained after the intervention ends? And if certain characteristics such as age and gender influence the effectiveness of video-based interventions? We are asking you to complete a short five-minute survey about what information we should extract from research studies included in the review, any patterns or trends we should look for, how we should share findings of the review, what we should consider to make sure everyone can access these findings, useful information for future reviews, and joining a small online group to help with the review until April next year. This survey is voluntary. You don't have to complete it and can skip questions you don't want to answer. There are no risks with taking part, but you will only be able to take part if you provide your consent. You can stop taking part at any time, but if you decide not to take part, please don't select done as your answers will be submitted and you won't be able to withdraw your information. Taking part in this small online group is also voluntary and you will be able to withdraw at any time without providing a reason. Information will be collected and stored in Microsoft Forms, which complies with general data protection regulations. Your email address is the only personal information that will be collected, and we will only use it to contact you with your permission. Information in Microsoft Forms will also be saved to the secure network at Queen's University Belfast, will be backed up daily by the university, and won't contain your email address to make sure your answers are anonymous. The research team will use your information to inform the review. Your information won't be published or shared outside of the review team and will be destroyed after five years. This study has been approved by the Ethics Committee in the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work. If you would like to take part, please click on the link. If you would like more information, please get in touch by email. Thank you for your help. Okay, so hopefully that just gives you a, a bit of a better flavour of the stakeholder engagement project that we did and, um, and and how we did it then. And so that video was, as I've mentioned, advertised on social media uh, and it was advertised several times during a four week period. So the questionnaire um, stay, the survey stayed open for four full weeks. And just in terms of results, then I'm just going to share with you um, a, a few of a few of the results from um, the main questions within the questionnaire survey. So first of all, we had 12 uh, respondents or 12 participants. So 12 people completed the online questionnaire, and this included two people with ASD, two parents or carers, one healthcare professional, three researchers who work in this particular field two people from other organisations and, and then one additional person. OK, so just looking at this question then, so what information is important to extract from the research studies that are included in the review? And so we had provided um, se several answers or several points that we thought were potentially useful to include in the review, as well as an other option for people to add in their own suggestions and ideas. So this chart shows respondents' perspectives then on, on what's important for data extraction. And the most frequent responses included um, extracting information on the equipment that is required for video-based interventions, uh, extracting information on who delivers the intervention and the training that's required for delivering the intervention as well as the length of each video-based intervention session. Moving on then to the question, so how do, how do you think we should share the findings of the review? And again, we provided um, suggestions for this and also provided an other option for people to add their own suggestions. So, so this particular chart then summarises the perspectives of respondents on how we should share the review findings. And the most frequent responses for this question included using a video that has people with ASD in it, using an infographic, a short summary for families, 
as well as an animated or cartoon video and a written report. <clears throat> This next chart then, so the, the question was, which of the following issues do we need to consider to ensure you can access findings of the review? So, so this chart really just demonstrates to us as a review team that we do need to consider accessibility when disseminating findings of the review, uh, particularly in relation to vision, hearing and learning difficulties such as dyslexia. So that is something that we will very much consider then whenever it comes to um, our dissemination and communication methods. And this is just the, the final chart that I would like to show you. Um, and this was, uh, so looking at other outcomes or skills is beyond the scope of this review. Um, but we would like to find out what other outcomes would be important to look at in a future review. And so again, we had listed some other potential outcomes. So this chart then provides respondents perspectives on, on other potentially useful outcomes that we could consider um, for a future review, uh, such as daily living and gross motor skills which were the, the two most frequently reported um, outcomes for future reviews. OK, so not, now that um, I've shared some of the, the results from the survey, I'd now like to discuss our experiences as a review team of actually carrying out this stakeholder engagement project. Um, and I will focus on some of the challenges that we encountered, as well as suggesting some potential solutions to these challenges. <clears throat> OK, so in terms of challenges, I, I do think it's really important to share and discuss these because we can really learn for, from them for the future. Um, and hopefully other researchers and other reviewers can learn from our challenges for future stakeholder engagement. The first thing to consider then, um, the ethics debate. So there, there is some debate around whether or not ethical approval should be required for stakeholder engagement. During my previous work um, involving patients in public as a healthcare researcher, so the work that I mentioned uh, whenever I was a researcher at the Northern Ireland Cerebral Palsy um, Register, ethical approval um, wasn't suggest suggested or required. But really from the outset of this particular stakeholder engagement project, ethical approval was recommended, uh, probably largely due to asking stakeholders to complete an online survey for them to provide their opinions on the review, even though this information was never actually going to, to be published. Um, we just wanted to gain these perspectives so it could direct um, you know, how the review progresses in terms of what information we need to extract, etc. However, uh, it does seem that ethical approval um, a lot of researchers do actually go through the ethical approval process for stakeholder engagement. Um, so it is a very grey area um, with many researchers um, um, going through this project before they even engage with their key stakeholders. In terms of the responses then, so as I mentioned earlier, the survey was open for four full weeks and it was shared across Facebook and Twitter platforms and um, several accounts frequently during this four week period. And I also took the opportunity to look at some tweet analytics. Um, so for example, my most recent tweet uh, related to the stakeholder engagement project was seen by almost 1400 people and 112 people interacted with the tweet. And that was as of um, last week. Despite this good engagement on Twitter, only 12 people actually completed the survey, um, as, as I've already mentioned. We, we only had 12 respondents. In addition, the, the most recent tweet did receive some quite challenging and difficult comments in relation to differences of opinion on some types of video based interventions and also in relation to terminology used within the review. So by sharing on social media, you do have to be prepared for people to be open and honest with you. Um, and, and of course, this can involve criticism because not everybody's going to agree with what you're doing or what you're proposing. Having said that, many of the challenging comments that we received on Twitter were indeed actually very helpful to us as reviewers. Um, for example, 
gaining perspectives from the autistic community has helped us really to carefully consider terminology that we use for the review. Many autistic people prefer use of identity first language, so saying autistic person, as opposed to person first language, so saying a person with autism. And um, so, of course, we need to consider our terminology very carefully whenever it comes to sharing information about the review. And this was something that um, I suppose I find quite difficult because as a healthcare professional, I have always been very much used to, to using person first language. So this is very much a change in practice for me. So yes, the comments and suggestions that were received via Twitter and also from the stakeholder uh, questionnaire survey highlighted that yes, it is most definitely possible to engage with stakeholders um, at various stages of the review process. But it is challenging to engage with stakeholders on a review that is currently underway. So on a review where stakeholders haven't um, been, been as involved right from the start of the review process. Therefore, I think that our stakeholder engagement was potentially less successful than it could have been due to the fact that we didn't engage with our key stakeholders right from the beginning of the process of the review. Moving on then to some potential solutions. So I, I didn't want to end on a negative note. Um, Yes, we, you know, uh, as reviewers and researchers, we do all experience challenges, um, but I think it's really important to discuss and, and identify solutions to these challenges. First of all, regarding ethics. So there, there's no doubt that having to seek ethical approval for stakeholder engagement costs time and adds burden to both the researchers or the review team and also those who are on the research ethics committees reviewing the applications. So it would be really helpful if ethical guidelines for stakeholder engagement could be clearer uh, and also could be consistent across disciplines so that whenever there's interdisciplinary working, um, things are very clear. Our experiences demonstrate that, yes, as I've mentioned, it is possible to engage with stakeholders at different stages of the review process and even when a review is already underway. But um, I think that our experiences have also highlighted that the importance really of stakeholder engagement early in the review process, um, because this is what's going to really help shape and direct the, the context and the focus of the review, thus making it more relevant for stakeholders and for the people who are potentially going to benefit from, from the review being carried out. As a review team, we can really see the value in sharing experiences of stakeholder engagement and evidence synthesis. So by sharing our experiences, um, it may help other review and research teams in the future, and it, it may indeed help our, um, our own practice of stakeholder engagement um, in future reviews. We, we recognise that it's really important to share the success stories. It's, of course, it's very useful to hear uh, about what worked well um, during stakeholder engagement, but we also believe that it's it's really vital and, and, and really important to share and discuss the challenges that we encounter uh, associated with stakeholder engagement, because we can learn from them and other researchers can learn from them too. Therefore, I hope that you'll, you'll have a think about your experiences of stakeholder engagement. So what has worked well for you in the past? What maybe hasn't worked so well? And um, could you share these with us? Um, I hope that after this presentation, there's some really fruitful discussions uh, around your experiences of stakeholder engagement and any thoughts that you might have that could help us in the future uh, and could help other reviewers and researchers in the future too, in terms of how we can, can benefit with stakeholders in evidence synthesis in a meaningful way. I'd like to just finish by acknowledging those who completed the stakeholder engagement survey uh, and those on the advisory group for the review, as well as the review team at Campbell UK in Ireland and Evidence Synthesis Ireland. Um, and thanks once again for the opportunity. It's been great to share with you today. 
These are just some of the key references used during the preparation of this presentation. And there really is a wealth of information out there. Um, please do go and find it. Um, it's, it's really useful. Uh, there's no point in reinventing the wheel whenever it comes to stakeholder engagement. And there really is a, a huge wealth of information out there um, for you to use to help you on your stakeholder engagement journey. So thank you very much for your time and attention at this webinar. I hope that you've found this topic useful and interesting. Um, and I've just put my email address and my Twitter handle on the slide. Please do get in touch. I'd be very happy to hear from you. Uh, and I hope that, that you can have some great discussions now um, on your experiences of stakeholder engagement in evidence synthesis. Thanks again. Bye. So Thank you, uh, Karen. And as I said before, unfortunately, Karen can't be physically with us, um, but uh, Jen and I will do our absolute best to kind of have that discussion with you. And I know certainly there were a lot of um, interesting things that I was uh, thinking about um, as well. And I see, um, Sabina, you've already put in the chat um, what could be the potential reasons for the low response rate. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I know specific or exact reasons, but I think actually low response rates are a fairly typical occurrence, not just in stakeholder engagement potentially, but in um, any kind of sort of research where you're you're reaching out uh, to the general public. Um, I want to I definitely want to kind of share with you some other experiences that we've had of uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, and um, I'm going to turn to Jen um, for now, but I just wanted to know if there was any kind of anything anybody wanted to say at this particular point. You're more than welcome to uh, contribute and to switch on your mic. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to respond to um, Sabina's comment in the chat. I, I can't speak to the low response rate um, for the particular review. Um, that was just shared but in terms of the kind of my experience of stakeholder engagement I suppose that there's um depending on the stakeholders that you're looking to engage with there might be different reasons for low response rates my experience engaging with stakeholders who are academic experts or topic experts um you tend to get better engagement um whereas when you're trying to engage with um people who would be the population that the studies are on it's, it's a little bit, you have to work a little bit harder. I was going to say it's more difficult to engage with people, but actually as researchers, it's our job to work harder to engage with people. Um, and there's a couple of different things that I've learned recently in terms of how to do better um, at doing that engagement work um, with um, partners or, or patients um, in reviews. And part of it is um, understanding the researchers speak a different language um, to to patients um, or, or, or stakeholders in um, review process. And so there's, there's an important to understand that gap between how we might talk about things and how we might understand things and, and, and evidence, just understanding that actually people's understanding of evidence synthesis, um, th there's a need to equip and capacity build um, with stakeholders so that they are able to confidently engage because if they don't understand what it is that evidence synthesis, they're just not gonna be as likely to be able to, to engage um, because they, don't feel like they are confident enough and they're well equipped enough to meaningfully contribute. So part of it is actually um, capacity building with the people that you're hoping to engage with. Um, but another way to, to, to engage with um, patient groups is to go via established um, groups that represent patients um, rather than trying to contact um, individual members of the public. So accessing through other established organizations where they maybe have um, panels of people who are willing to speak to researchers or maybe have a basic level of training and understanding um, can help improve um, engagement and, and yeah, really enabling people to engage with a research team on, a, on an equal level. My, my toppings there. Um, Howard, um, I can see that Howard White has a hand up. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Joe. Actually, answer one of my two questions. The first one was indeed about do you try to explain this is systematic review and what a review is, or do you just say it's research about a particular topic and to use on research? I think you've explained that. Um, the second question I had um, is that uh, is this review just an effectiveness review, the one on ASD? Because a lot of the questions I think that 
stakeholders, uh, parents of children with ASD, for example, I'd be interested in are probably more around implementation issues, more like to get from qualitative synthesis than effectiveness studies. So what was this and how did you address that? And just to flag, not a question, that Vivian has a, also a project on stakeholder engagement, so she's on the call, so maybe we can try and get five minutes to her to speak about her experience too. Yeah, um, my understanding is that um, this is a um, an effectiveness uh, review, and um, and I think it just definitely speaks to sort of the challenges that Karen sort of raised. Actually, when you do try and start to involve stakeholders when you're halfway through a review, then that can be problematic, and probably starting earlier is easier. But it's not a reason not to involve stakeholders that's for sure and um, even because just because you didn't look at it so i think there are certainly challenges around that um as well um, but i certainly agree with jen in terms of capacity building um, and you know giving people the best possible chance to contribute in a in a meaningful way vivian i don't know whether you want to say anything about um the review that harage just mentioned um. No, uh, this has been a great um, session. Um, we've actually got a grant from our Canadian Institutes of Health Research on um, methods for stakeholder engagement. So what is the evidence for the best ways to engage stakeholders and at what point in the process and how to you know define the roles um, that we're planning to get that started uh, I think in, in March or so next year. And it'd be great to connect with you offline to see if some of your group would like to be involved. There are some other folk in uh, the UK involved, uh, including Alex Pollock, who you probably know um, from the active uh, group. Um, so yeah, it's been a great session, thank you. I think we're all definitely uh, learning and uh, but it's great because you know this is how we do learn and you know through our own experiences and other people's as well so um, Jen I know that you are working in um, on another review where you are starting with stakeholder engagement from the very start so I wonder if you want to kind of mention a little bit about that and what you're doing and are you using such creative things as Powtoon I got a bit of a fright then when I realized you were having video within a video which I thought was super meta um, <laughs> but um, people are so creative um, in terms of the methods that they use and uh, anyway yeah, no, just um, Vivian, as you mentioned, um, Alex Pollock, so I've just shared a link in the chat um, to one of Alex's um, publications um, and also a link to some of the resources that are um, have been developed by Cochrane around meaningful um, engagement um, of partners and, and stakeholders in reviews. They're really well set out resources, really easy to follow um, that just kind of help you think through the process of why you might engage with stakeholders when you want to do it and how you're actually going to engage with them. Um, so yeah, the, Sarah, we have um, a project at the moment um, which is related to COVID. Um, it's a, a series of evidence syntheses on the determinants of COVID related health protective behaviours. So essentially what factors influence how how much or how often people engage in all the things that we're supposed to be doing, like wearing masks and social distancing and washing our hands um, and those behaviours. And um, we are approaching stakeholder engagement um, in two different ways um, for two different groups of stakeholders, essentially. Um, so the first group of stakeholders are our advisory group, um, and that's a group of um, comprising of ap academic experts, lots of brilliant evidence synthesis people, some of whom are on the call today. Um, and also we have engagement with um, some policymakers who are interested or potentially interested in the end products of um, our reviews. And then we also have some topic experts in terms of academic topic experts on health behaviour and behaviour change interventions. And that group, we've engaged that group at the level where they are really shaping the review in terms of the outcomes that we're going to prioritise and the way that we look to extract data from the studies that we're um, going to include in the review. 
Um, and so, you know, one, one of the, the things about that, like we can we can already see the influence on our thinking about it because we went into the um, we had a see we actually um, we asked quite a lot of people to join the advisory groups and they all said yes, which was brilliant. But we had, had a series of different advisory groups and there were differences of opinion across the different groups. And then there were some things that were that were the same. And actually, we what we had thought that we were going to do in terms of data extraction um, the history of the project was that we'd done a rapid review first and now we're doing a full systematic reviews and so we were already aware of the kind of data that we're likely to find and we knew that we weren't finding very much information about differences in behavior depending on the sector um, so whether it's in schools or in hospitals or with the general public or sports and leisure contexts so we were going to ditch that um, as, a, as a as a thing that we were going to extract because we thought well the, the data is just not there but actually the advisory group, the policymakers were very, very clear that they really want to know that information. They want to know about behaviours in those specific contexts. And so that was really helpful to inform what we were doing. It may be that the data doesn't exist when we get to find the studies, but at least we can then highlight that that's the gap. The policymakers want to know this information and the research just isn't, isn't addressing it. So there's a real and immediate impact on, on how we're approaching um, the review and, and what data we're extracting. So that's just one example of how it could, kind of that advisory group has, has helped to shape what we're doing. Um, and then the other group that we're engaging with, and we're just at the beginning process of that, is members of the general public, because this the, the topic of the review is relevant to, to all of us. Um, and if we were being lazy about it, we could argue that, well, the review team are also members of the general public, and so we don't need to engage with stakeholders. But really, you know, we're researchers and we come at it with that approach and so it was important for us to engage with people who have a different perspective to us so the research team are evidence synthesis geeks and health behavior people and psychologists mostly um, and so it was yeah important to just find different perspectives and so we have recruited um, partners in different ways um, one is through task exchange and um, which is the Cochrane platform um, and so we have a, a couple of people there who are scientists but not psychology and health behavior people but they have a unique perspective that they can um, offer and then we are engaging with um, another group that has already been trained in understanding evidence synthesis and um, rapid reviews particularly so there's a group that's been trained um, in by um, a team at McMaster and um, through the COVID end project and um, that I'm sure Vivian is aware of and um, with Maureen Smith and Maureen Dobbins and Andrea Trigo. Um, who had developed a training module for members of the public who wanted to contribute to evidence synthesis around COVID. Um, and so people were offered training. I think it was like a little kind of a, a brief 10 session training session so that they really got a good grounding and understanding what evidence synthesis is and what it is that, how they can actually contribute. Um, and there's a really great webinar. Um, I'm looking for the link and I'll... If I can find it, I'll put it in the chat um, where there was a, a person who had um, the experience of being a partner on a review process. And she shared her perspective on what it was like from from her end of things. So there's, you know, researchers, we think that we're doing things a certain way. And actually for the, um, the partners, it was really interesting to hear um, her perspective. Um, and I think the, the kind of key learnings from that that I am hoping to take forward in the work that we're doing um, next is just about, you know, valuing people's time, you know, understanding that their time is, is as valuable as a researcher's time. And if we have the opportunity at the outset of a grant that we budget plenty of money and time to pay people um, to really value their time. And just to communicate, communicate really often, communicate really clearly as to what your expectations are, what's going to be expected of them, what the time commitment is, um, and just letting them know if there's any delays where they may be expecting to hear from you, but um, things happen and there's delays, which you know, as researchers, we know that that happens, but members of the public might not. So it's just making sure that you kind of keep keep communicating um, so that everybody, everybody knows exactly what's, um, what's going on. And I do think that the the value in having a group of people who've already been trained is that they are on that, they, ha they have the confidence to really actively engage um, in the review process as, as members of the team, rather than just as, you know, being consulted occasionally. Um, so yeah, that's, we were kind of early on in the process, um, but we're really excited to be able to have a group of people that we can work with in partnership and work with throughout the, the course of the review. Um, I've noticed there's a, a, a question in the chat about, do the groups engage with each other? Um, so far, no, <laughs> they haven't. Um, we do plan to have some engagement um, between the different 
groups um, our sort of advisors and then our, our partners. Um, but we felt that it was important to give our partners space to interact with each other. But I think that coming into a group of you know, advisor or, you know, the advisory group with lots of professors and policymakers and, you know, people with that status attached to them could be potentially intimidating um, for partners. So we felt that it was important to have those groups separate so that partners could could contribute and could feel free to to ask whatever questions they want without feeling intimidated by the um, advisory group. At some point later in the process, we would really like to provide the opportunity for the partners um, to take a lead in actually speaking to the advisory group, but we wanna get into the process and, and do that um, really well later on. So yeah, um, Sarah has a hand up. Hi, thank you for answering that. I've been thinking about it because I recently submitted a proposal for a participatory evidence synthesis. So I've been trying to think through how to um, not only increase engagement from all of the different stakeholder groups you defined, but create space for them to engage with each other. Um, and I've, I've thought about both kind of the intimidation that folks might feel in entering into those spaces and I've been wondering if anyone has thought about like how to create um, at the very start of a process uh, how to create like a co co-teaching and co-learning environment that allows everyone to come to the table feeling like they are an expert in some way to like reduce that that sense of intimidation um but yeah so it's interesting to hear kind of you've taken this approach of let's build up capacity and when we feel like we're there bringing people to the table that's an yeah an interesting way to think about it but yeah, I mean, Sarah, and like, it's brilliant that you're thinking in that way. And I, I can't say that I've cracked it. That's the approach that we've decided to take. And, you know, it, it may be just that, yeah, you kind of try. And it depends on the group of people as well. You know, that it may be that they're a group of people that are already well versed in research and experienced in that space and that they don't need that that time. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's really important to just 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 think through that process and think through what it's going to be like for from the, the stakeholders perspective and not just from our own perspective as researchers. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. And I thought as well, one of the really interesting things that um, Karen raised in terms of challenges was around ethics and ethical approval. And I remember a number of years ago, and this was written in relation to um, primary research, not necessarily um, evidence synthesis, and we were doing research with children and setting up very specific children's research advisory groups and so a lot of capacity building was required for those and a lot of thinking through what is possible and meaningful for children to contribute and seeing them as equal partners but not necessarily experts in research because that's our jobs but they're experts in childhood or experts in whatever um whoever it is that you're um sort of reaching out to Anyway, the reason I mentioned that was because um, at, when and certainly in our school, and I think our, our university might be particularly cautious, I'm not sure, it was the case that anybody who was doing a children's research advisory group had to get ethical approval. And then as our ethics committee thought it through and understood more of what was being asked and what was and wasn't data, um, it's no longer required for ethical approval for children's research advisory groups. Obviously, there are certain uh, things that need to be standards and need to be met for that but um but maybe it's going to be the same with you know stakeholder engagement I, I feel that that was kind of quite a cautious maybe decision uh, on the part of the ethics committee which is fine especially when data are being collected but um oh um, the thought has just completely left me where I was going with that oh yes but of course it is time consuming for the research team who have maybe not factored that into it and ethical approval can be quite a long process and um, so I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that Jen or whether anybody else has any thoughts on that particularly because it's it might be an issue for others yeah so for in my experience in various different reviews with um various different modes of engaging with stakeholders is that there, there, there is no kind of hard and fast rules or specific guidelines, as, as Karen mentioned. Um, 
I think for us, for, for the, our approach at the moment, for the current set of um, reviews that we're working on, we are going to seek ethical approval because we know that we actually want to have an opportunity to write about the process of yeah. stakeholder engagement. And actually, we're hoping that, um, you know, our partners in the review will possibly take a lead in, in writing about that um, experience so that we can kind of share that. And so we felt that it was, net, you know, it was, it was good um, to get ethical approval so that we can actually publish and write about the process and, and use the experience as, as data. Um, whereas in other reviews that I've worked on where we had um, stakeholder engagements and, and engaging with the, the specific population that would be um, within the, the interventions, we didn't get ethical approval because the we knew that the stakeholder engagement we wouldn't be writing about it we wouldn't be publishing it we wouldn't be you know talking publicly about it that it was very much that the engagement was to inform the review process and it was regarded as a consultation and not as research in and of itself but yeah it's a, it, it's it's a line that needs to be navigated and you know it, it is going to vary university to university and school to school I think yeah and also I suppose depending on the level of stakeholder engagement as well and what that um, maybe looks like. I'm very conscious that we're now two minutes to the hour. I don't know whether anybody has any kind of final words that they want to say. If you do, put your hand up while I'm talking. <laughs> and um, but I just, I mean, it just remains for me to say thank you so much to Campbell um, for inviting us uh, to do this presentation and webinar. And I hope it's been useful um, to you. Uh, but please do get in touch with us. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that Karen mentioned in her talk about uh, an interview with Sally Crow. And if you want to read that interview, you can find it on the Meta Evidence blog, um, which uh, will uh, give you lots of, if you haven't already accessed it, uh, other information about systematic reviews in hopefully a, a fairly accessible way. And um, so thank you um, to everyone who set up the uh, webinar and being behind the scenes appreciate it very much thank you Jen as well um, and a huge thanks to Karen and um, to Kira too who I know has been working behind the scenes and on this review as well okay thank you very much and uh, have a lovely rest of the day and a good rest of the week thanks all thank you bye